So today I am going to talk about uh, a research, an ongoing research since my uh, start in research that was like in the end of the 90s. It's about ordinary environmentalism. So, and I'm going to talk about mobilization and spaces. The first thing, just, oh, not working, not working. So first thing, uh, I am not, I have been conducting this research in different countries all over Europe, in the States also. Uh, I've been in Russia, in Netherlands, in Germany, in England, in France, obviously, but also in the States. And there is no good way to investigate such mobilization. And I'm going to talk today on how this mobilization has uh, driven me to use other methodology in order to be known. So one thing, as you might know already, I am a geographer, I am not an economist, I am not a political scientist. And I think that being an environmentalist made me thought, made me think, or made me, well, I, I, I was thinking that geography was becoming more and more important in terms of mobilization. If you think of mobilization during the 19th and 20th century, it was all about the social question. You know, it was like social security, especially in France. I mean, the, the, the issues were mainly focused on salaries, on workers, on, not on spaces. And I think that one thing which is quite new with environment, the environmental issue, it's for the first time perhaps in history that the political question and the geographical question m m meet. And it's very important because it's not just, uh, it's a, a common geography. It's not just a discipline I am talking about. Uh, and all kinds of spaces, if you think of the globe, if you think of local localities, if you think of na nations or states, if you think of countries, all these spaces are being played out again through the environmental issue. This is something that we have, uh, and most people do, uh, do mobilize because of this space. They want to protect, they want to defend, they want to change, they want to transform. So I would say that the geographical issue has replaced the social question, uh, su uh, uh, such, uh, uh, well, from the 70s on. So this is the first hypothesis I have been working on, that most mobilization are about spaces right now. All kinds of spaces, once again. Huh? Um, and so this is my purpose, to analyze how it has been uh, redoing the mobilization. Because when we were working on social issues, for example, in factories and trying to see how people were uh, mobilizing, and, uh, but with spaces, something different is playing. So there are three major issues, I think. This is the relationship between local and global, which has been identified very, very early in the environmental movement. Or you could say also the issue between place and earth. This is another way of saying it. The issue of the environmental as being the biophysical. I mean, now uh, most politicians have have to take into account the biophysical issues. They didn't have to take into account these biophysical issues before the turn of the century. I mean, it was not in their mandate. And so it is something different. And also they have to take into account the scales of regulation. This is something that has to do with spaces, uh, but it's, well, more common, I guess. So, you see, and so to qualify the ordinary environmentalism would be to qualify how this mobilization has been playing with spaces, 
uh, but not just spaces, uh, abstract spaces, but very material spaces. How they do confront to that. So, uh, our, my objective with my team has been to understand and to broaden the, understandi the understanding of form and practices of environmentalism. And I often look at uh, mobilization which I quite, quite invisible, like the women mobilization for ecology, for example, uh, such as uh, w uh, such one you find in very, very uh, small spaces. For example, for my PhD, I was working on how women have taken care of free cats in cities. I mean, they do mobilize uh, and there are networks and European networks of people who do mobilize to protect cats, for example. And you can see them in the street sometimes if you look at them. But it's, it's why I call it ordinary environmentalism. It's not Greenpeace, you know. It's very day-to-day -day mobilization to protect spaces and to repair places. So it's also to analyze the role of this environmentalism in the renewal of territories. And right now, I'm working at different scales with uh, cities also, seeing how this mobilization for food, for animals, for vegetation, are renewing the link to policy making, uh, locally speaking, and how they are uh, renewing what politics do mean. I mean, it's m mostly, it mostly has to do with ordinary politics. I mean, we have a French uh, uh, academic who talked about that. Uh, it's, uh, it's something to do with ordinary politics, day-to-day -day politics. So these are pictures of people, you know, doing whatever they have to do in cities, but it could be in rural space also. I mean, it doesn't matter. These people, I mean, nobody would look at them and say this is a mobilization, you know, because our usual gaze on mobilization has to do with COP26, has to do with massive and big uh, players uh, in the game. But these people are very numerous. Uh, and the number of people uh, registering in the collectives uh, have been uh, it's an upward trend since uh, the turn of the century, very much. So it's interesting to see how these people are reconfiguring the way we understand mobilization. So they can be related to all kinds of things, air, water quality, urban sprawl, urban agriculture, uh, free cats, uh, wildlife, uh, mushrooms, uh, whatever. I mean, you find all kinds of people. And so we have a quite broad definition of what uh, ordinary environmentalism means. It goes from very overtly political acts in cities. Uh, I work especially in cities, but uh, yes. Oh, I have to get back in, uh, in, in, the, in the framework. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> And also, they have a very different range of professionalization. This is something very important. Some of them are very rich, and some of them are very poor. Uh, the average uh, degree of uh, finance for these collectives in France is around 7,000 euros per year. So it's a very little amount. But if you do the same work in the States, you find a very different number, much bigger number. So this collective action, uh, well, is very interesting to observe uh, because it tests a very direct relationality, is what I call, what Micheletti has called individualized collective action. It's a new way of working together, and it goes with the, 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 the practice of responsibility, of seeking the common good for the creation of concrete, everyday arenas for citizens 
alone of without us, and it's always without us mostly, to address problems that they, have, that they believe affect what they call the good life. And this idea of a good life is very important nowadays. It's, I mean, when you work, for example, in Russia and you go in very uh, harsh neighborhood, you find people who want a good life. I mean, it's not because they don't live in good neighborhoods that they don't want a good life. So they're trying to repair whatever is around in order for them to make a good life for themselves. And this repairing has to do with the environmental issue in the broader sense. And to do so, I'm not moving anymore, promise. And to do so, they, what I call creating alliances. Huh? And these alliances can be many. I mean, they can be numerous. And it's what I call socio-environmental communities. It can be with cats, cockroaches, mushrooms, bees. It can be with noise interpretation. It can be with creating music in different places. And it's all kind of activities that have been considered very, very little and that we emphasize today. It's also because I do, uh, I am interested in the theory of care and especially of environmental care. Uh, so when I, uh, I have published on this uh, topic, how do people do exchange with cats in order to create alliances? How do they exchange with mushrooms, for example? How do they know that mushrooms are happy? And how can they keep them happy in order for them to show them around? It's the same for bees. I mean, it's, uh, when you go in the south of Paris, there is a, a group of people who are keeping bees and creating honey. And so it's a very hybrid community of beekeepers and bees. And they, well, it's very important for them to be able to say, are the bees happy? You know, it's like something they're looking after in order to see, to, re, to, to, to detect the signs of their happiness. They say, you know, bees are wild uh, animals, so we can't say when they are happy or not. We have to observe and to be very humble. So it's something that has to do also with being very discreet in the city. So this is a definition of Lestel about hybrid community. Uh, and I think it's an interesting one. It talks also about semiotics. Uh, I have been working in the field, uh, a, a little in the field of biosemiotics. I don't know if you know this current of thought. It has taken after the 60s uh, uh, in, 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 the, in the wake of uh, ethology, you know, all the work of, uh, of uh, different uh, ethologists such as Coran, Cor Conrad Lorenz, you might know of, or other guys like that. And these guys of biosemiotics, they say, well, you can work on both sides, on the side of the cat and on the side of the human who take care of the cat. You can, you know, just see how the dialogue goes on. So this is the, 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 the bottom line of what I do. So this implies to work with, well, with individuals, with collectives also, but with spaces and spaces which are full of life, not just uh, abstract spaces, but also with time. We have to see how these animals are living. You know, for example, I do something about insects in cities. You can't do anything with insects and trying to see how insects are going if you don't work with time. You need to see how they multiply, how they go along with kids, because it is with kids. So we have like these four, uh, these four uh, ways of seeing how this uh, collective mobilization are deploying. Okay, so this is about material space. So why do I, uh, I use the word ordinary? I, I guess you have uh, understood now why, but it is also related because we speak 
about unremarkable spaces. I mean, the environmental movement has dedicated itself mostly to big spaces, big mammals, for example. Who wants to protect the cockroach? I mean, who wants to pay to protect the cockroach or other type of small insects like that? Uh, you know, nobody, uh, I mean, some years ago when I started about this work, some people told me, well, the market is sufficient because with the market you can protect the elephant. Everybody will want to pay to protect the elephant, but who will want to protect such unremarkable spaces? I mean, it has something to do with the ordinary which is around us and that nobody cares about. It's also related to what uh, these two anarchists said uh, in the last century. I mean, it has something to do with the productive activities around us. All this gesture we have, this everyday gesture with which we produce the environment and which are not captured by capitalism. They are before, they are on the side, they are ignored, they are invisibilized. And it's why it's also a lot about women. I don't know if you know about uh, what has been said about environmental issues, that it is more uh, a feminine issue than a masculine one. I mean, uh, did you read about that? No? There is a, a strong paper about it. Some of you have read. And it's because it is related to small gesture. This is the conclusion of the, the, the authors of the article. They say, well, it is because it has to do with day-to-day -day gestures. And uh, so, well, it doesn't interest people. It doesn't interest men. And I remember starting about animals in cities and this woman telling me that she was caring for cats while men were caring for elephants. And there was something which had to do with size. So, you know, this is once again a, a, a power issue. Uh, how people do take care of this world and how it is going uh, right now. Yes? Uh, it's, uh, uh, is, uh, the, the, the author's name is uh, Aaron... Uh, draw something and Wilkie. It's, uh, I just, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give it to you afterwards because it's on my computer, but, uh, it but if I stop everything, I, I won't be able to. It has been published in 20, 2016, so it's quite recent. And it, it is uh, uh, an advice to people and doing advi advi uh, uh, publicity. Uh, especially on cars, for example, because hybrid were selling less uh, because men didn't want hybrid, you know, they wanted big cars. So they said, well, what you have to do to sell hybrid to men and not only to women, for example. So it's just such an article. Okay, let's go back to theory, history. Uh, Well, if you go back in the 19th century, for example, uh, mobilization were mostly analyzed uh, looking at crowds, public, masses, uh, and they were very much part of... Uh, uh, I mean, they were, they were thought as being, uh, as being angry, dangerous, uh, and so this is, for example, uh, a, a paper which has been written on the right by Guy de Maupassant and he criticized very much the crowds because he thinks that they are irrational and very menacing. I mean, uh, so this was how we saw the crowds at the time and people mobilize, mobilizing. And if you think about the French Revolution, for example, and you read Chateaubriand, or you read other, uh, other authors of the time, mostly crowds were seen as the people being dangerous. So, I mean, this was part of how we, 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 we saw these crowds and this mobilization. 
And we saw them also, there is another distinctive mark. We saw them as being uh, with feelings. I mean, not rationality. We didn't think about their rationality. We thought about the anger, we thought about the passion, and it was mostly about feeling, you know. So this was the 19th century, and uh, if you... This is an author that I very much like. Who knows him? He was Scottish. He was a biologist. You know him? In the introduction, I may because I like him very much. He's an artist, he was an urban planner. He did work all over the world, in India, in Scotland. In, and what was very interesting that he saw people in cities as a way to renew the way of doing cities at the time. So he didn't see this mobilization as crowds. He saw this mobilization as a way to work the fabric of the city with people. That's why I, I like him very much. And, uh, and it was, uh, and not only that, as you can see, this is the river. Uh, and he saw, he was the inventor of the bioregionalism. Uh, and not only did he work with people in the city, he worked also with the environment and work with the environment at the scale of the region. So that was one of the first one to link people and spaces, as I told you, in terms of giving them power over their environment. That's why I like him very much. It's uh, one of the first to have done that uh, in the 19, uh, at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th. So, and he, he was using all kind of methodology, you know, surveys, creation of urban garden in areas, observation towers, acting as civic museum for cities. He has a very rich uh, work over time. And also this anarchist, uh, he was very much inspired by the anti-utilitarian thinkers such as John Ruskin. John Ruskin was a guy very important even for anarchist thinkers right now in Spain. Uh, I'm working with them right now and they're trying to reintroduce pastora pastoralism, and, you know, and they always quoting Ruskin as being a, a major thinker of the time. And uh, so he was, you know, Involving all, in all kinds of debate, uh, in zoology, botany, geography. Uh, and so it, it distinguished between two times, what he called the time of, the, of his time, the paleo technique, ancient technique time, and also the new order, the new order would be based on uh, an alliance with nature. He, he was the one uh, very much in advance in terms of seeing the future because already he said that, well, the future will be based on an alliance with nature. Another school of thoughts which is quite important in relating this uh, civic mobilization with uh, spaces is the Chicago School. You may know it. Yes, some of you do. I mean, they have been used very much in geography, especially to distinguish different areas in cities in terms of planning, for example. Uh, but they were used also to analyze the movements of migrants in Chicago at the time. So, and they were trying to see these migrants in terms of ecology. Uh, and that was the first time that a social uh, work, yeah, a social academic work, was using the work of ecologists, plant ecologists at the time. That was the work of Clements. Clements. Uh, and you know what's, uh, I don't know, I, 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 I looked online about what Abadi talked to you about. He didn't talk to you so much about plants. He talked to you very much about animals. But the ecology of the time, of the 19th century, 
was very much about the succession of plant seed space. You know, the first there is a colonization by moss, for example. Then there is another kind of plants who take uh, over, then another one, then there are trees, then trees are falling and other trees are coming, and all this movement. So this guy of the Chicago school, they use the same uh, referential in order to explain how migrants were installing in cities. I mean, the first wave of migrants, they're just like, you know, plants, uh, then they're getting richer, they're moving in other areas and such and such. So they were very much relating spaces and uh, civic mobilization. What was interesting in these studies, uh, uh, it's uh, they were uh, thinking of the environment as being uh, the mark on, uh, as being imprinted by human forces. I mean, as being reflecting human forces. And there was this guy, Burgess, who was, uh, who was quite active at the time. Uh, and they were talking about the env urban environment. This is a quote. Uh, and they thought that the city was the most uh, successful attempt by human species or human, human people to, to transform their environment according to their own desires. You know, it was subjugating nature somehow. So, uh, and what we forgot later on uh, is the idea uh, of, uh, of space, of the, the link between, in, uh, you will see on the next uh, slide, that uh, the analysis of mobilization in the 60s has very much forgot this link between mobilization and space. Uh, these two thinkers of the time did not forget this thing. I mean, uh, so if you think, for example, on uh, the 20th century literature on mobilization, they marked by rationalism, mostly. I mean, people do mobilize according to their own interest. Uh, and this analysis forgot about the idea of culture. Uh, it was just a resource. I mean, you know, the, the, all this analysis of mobilization was very much marked by the idea that people were going out in the world because they wanted something uh, out of this, out of culture, out. They didn't think of passion anymore, they didn't think of feeling anymore, and they didn't think of spaces anymore. The, uh, in, after the 60s, uh, in the wake of 68 and so, all over the world, there were these new social movements you have heard of, I think. It was very much about identity, but, uh, you know, this was describing the mutation of post-industrial societies. And so, you know, feminism, ecology, uh, all these movements were very much thought by academics as a way for groups to define their identity, not as workers, you know. It was something aside from being just workers. So this was a new way of analyzing uh, mobilization. Uh, so you see, there was there is really two 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 world in the analysis of mobilization. Uh, I would say a world which is made of rationality, analyzing the the the, the rationality of groups in terms of taking uh, opportunity outside of them. Even political opportunity, you can say. I mean, groups gather and they just seize whatever opportunities around them. And there is a, 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 a way of analyzing mobilization, which is much more about passion, feelings, culture. Yeah. Uh, and these are very different groups. And you can say that uh, this ordinary environmentalism I've been showing you is somewhere in between, because I've seen people 
uh, taking opportunity of resources around them, but they're very much invested in uh, feeling for the living beings around them, for beauty, for, for all these kind of things. So this is something, and it goes with the counterculture of uh, 68, uh, and with the renewal of this idea of sensitivity uh, brought by people like, uh, you know, Guattari, even with the psychoanalysis, uh, Deleuze has been working around them. So it's like kind of moments. On the side of scientific ecology in this time, uh, there was an uh, the importance uh, being taken by the systemic ecology. I think that we have talked a little bit about that at the beginning. You remember this, you know, uh, schema with uh, arrows going everywhere in all direction, looping around. So this kind of systemic ecology where you see uh, things are taken like boxes and you see energy uh, going from one box to the other. Uh, and on this side of political ecology, there are two kinds of mobilization in this time. There was what we call the radical ecology anchored uh, in the reform of lifestyle and an environmentalist ecology, which is much more concerned with the protection of nature. So in the 60s until the 80s, I would say, that goes like that. And that's the moment uh, that, uh, that's the moment where big mobilization like her first Greenpeace and such are growing, are, are expanding, you know. And uh, some of them are totally oriented towards the protection of nature and very little towards the protection of people. They're not so social, not at all. Uh, so this is part of the, uh, of the analysis we can have today. Well, this I have been showing you. There is the oil shocks, it's part of the history. The Brentland report, which is 87, so we're going further. And the IPCC and all this movement, we won't go further on that. So, as I told you, there is the emergence of global ecological movement. There is also the dilution of the radicality of certain ecologists' proposal. And there is the emergence of the figure of what we call the expert activist. You know, these guys who knows better and goes talking to uh, elected people, uh, to technician, uh, uh, and say something about nature. For example, he, she is a specialist of butterflies, of water, of whatever, weather even, and is not so much anymore an activist, but much more an expert. So it's this conjunction, such as you see, a structure very much the, the, the mobilization, mobilization of today. So, and in France, especially in 2007, uh, these expert activists were invited, I was invited also, uh, to the table of, the, of this Grenelle de l'environnement, you know, uh, I was invited in the name of, uh, of uh, urban ecology, you know, because I was supposed to be the specialist of that. Uh, and we talked with elected, we tried to rationalize what we wanted and tried to make them understand that it was better to transform politics in order to, be, to have a better environmental politics. Uh, so that was you know, uh, a negotiation of some, of some sort. But it didn't totally work because there still were uh, activists which were much more radical, much more devoted to transforming lifestyles, to contesting, to whatever. I mean, especially in rural spaces. Uh, much more in rural spaces, I would say, than in urban spaces.
So where we are now, and uh, so there are radical militant alternatives, well, all kinds between squats and uh, civil disobedience and such. Uh, uh, there are different groups, anti-specist, anti-advertising, anti-vivisection, anti, many anti. Uh, well, there are movements who are going in different alternative modes of life, such as degrowth. You have talked about degrowth as being a rational uh, academic movement, but there are also very, very... Uh, uh, much activist movement about that. And in France, especially if you look, that's what I was told you, there is a, a rate, a growing rate that you can observe worldwide of civic mobilization. You know, it's very important to see that at a, at a very global scale, not only in France. It's true in France, it's true in Europe. You can have certain numbers, it's not easy to have these numbers. Uh, especially because some of these collectives are formal and some are informal. Some informal have been working together since decades and some formal are just, you know, uh, working together for some years then dissolving. Uh, one thing that has changed right now is these groups, they need money uh, in order to work with uh, cities, for example. So. And to get this money, they need to be formalized. I mean, they need to have moral, what we call in France, uh, 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 devenir un personnage, uh, une personne morale, uh, in order to get this money, these funds from cities, region, and such. So it has urged this movement just to get more formal, uh, which is not. I mean, that didn't, uh, that didn't uh, make anybody happy. There are also other kinds of mobilization. This is one, for example, uh, what we call direct action. Uh, that is, no intermediaries, no uh, collectivity, no collectives, uh, for example, no parties. And the idea is to, it's to do and not to, uh, to speak. So the, 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 this is part also of what has made ordinary environmentalism, is the idea we need to do not to speak. We need to take care of whatever is around us, not to speak about it and try to, uh, to, 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 uh, to influence people about it. So, uh, meanwhile, until COP21, uh, the development of these big organizations, the one I have been talking about, uh, like Greenpeace and uh, such, uh, first and such, they were very much invited uh, in, COP20, uh, in, in COP21 in 2015 in Paris. Uh, and that was a new thing for, for these people to be integrated in such politics. So this is also new. Uh, and this is interesting because it's not only at this global scale. Some of these people of these great big movements have also networks with grassroots movements. They're very much in networks in uh, what we call I mean, if I do employ the word of Ostrom about it, the polycentric organization with different level and scales of organization. Uh, so if you work today, I'm going to show you with any of this network, even the smaller one, they're always related to other kind of levels. I mean, they very much work in networks. And more often because of internet, uh, you know, uh, the possibility opened by uh, these kind of tools have changed very much the way these organizations have been working together. So it's, uh, it's important to see. It's also important to see that uh, uh, I don't know if you remark, like two days ago, there was a, a big hurrah of the mobilization movement. 
no, l'affaire du siècle. Did you follow l'affaire du siècle? Because it was like a gathering of more than like two million of people who have signed uh, this uh, judicial struggle uh, against the state of France as being inactive in terms of uh, regarding its engagements towards 1.5 degrees. So this is a new way of fighting for mobilization. Uh, very interesting one at different levels because even at the city levels I have seen, I'm working in, in the south of Paris, not south of Paris, but south of the, of the greater Paris, uh, with um, local mobilization who have been gathering and trying to tackle the municipality for not doing what it uh, was, uh, what uh, they uh, uh, they, uh, they were supposed to do in terms of, of climate uh, change. So this is a new way of fighting, very, very important one, uh, I think. And this is interesting because the Paris Agreement of the COP21, which was not uh, compulsory uh, in terms of, uh, even though it is used in this judicial struggle as being a deadline, some, and it has been uh, positively judged as being such. For example, the judge that say, well, yes, the state has not respected the 1.5 1, 1. degrees. So even if it's not compulsory, it has been used in ju uh, uh, judicial struggles. So that was uh, uh, different organizations that were uh, involved in the COP21. You can see uh, uh, attack which is uh, very, uh, uh, I don't know if you know attack, it's a, f okay, so I, I don't have to explain and translate. Uh, it's uh, very much about work also, you know, uh, this attack. There was WWF, this one is a more classical, a classic one in terms of environmental issue. There was uh, Oxfam, which is uh, another one. There was uh, Greenpeace, uh, uh, Les Amis de la Terre, uh, uh, Friends of Earth, I was trying to translate, uh, well, 350.org also. Uh, so this is a very classical uh, environmental organization. It's a big gathering at the scale of France, but it is networked to, I don't know, thousands of very small grassroots organizations. France Nature Environnement. It was born in the, uh, uh, with 68, you know, in the wake of 68, and it has, you know, gathered momentum through years and decades, and it's a very powerful now, uh, nowadays uh, players. So, okay, this one is about mostly mobilizing through, through you know, this one uh, and to sign. Also, there is another organization, uh, another work you might know of. Uh, uh, it's the Environmental Justice Atlas. Do you know it? You don't know it? Well, you have to go online and look at that. I mean, you might, I, I was looking at what you want to do in terms of poster. I think uh, if you go online, this is the address uh, you can see. So it's a global map of environmental justice with all kinds of conflicts at different scales. Uh, it has been documented through years and years. Uh, and uh, so there are uh, quite interesting uh, case study uh, about that. It's mostly, it's, well, when I am tackling the ordinary environmentalism, I would say that it's not always about this issue. It's mostly very uh, conflictual, but it's quite an interesting work uh, that has been done at a global scale. I guess some of you have found it because I saw the, the way you're looking at you. So, okay, so how do we analyze environmental mobilization today? So there is the analysis of protest movement against technologies, uh, uh, infrastructure. There is also uh, a sociology of techno-scientific controversies. Uh, this is how the academic world uh, has been uh, 
looking at it. Uh, and there is this multiplicity of local citizen ecological commitments and figures of ordinary resistance. It's what I call the political critique in act of everyday life. You know, is this invisible ecological co commitments, this everyday activism, you know. Uh, it's what is called also the politics of everyday. So, uh, when you look at that, you focus on low-key transformation of spaces and lifestyle. You observe also uh, this silent transformation of production, consumption, distribution processes in cities uh, with or without the municipalities, the region or, or whatever. I'm right now working, we have been creating a, a, a cooperative about food cooperative, and then we have been related this cooperative with restaurants, with repair cycles, with gardening, and now we're creating the um, social security of alimentation at the scale of a, a bigger territory. So we're networking. Uh, it's like an everyday transformation of space. Uh, it's where also in this low-key transformation you can find the conjunction between social justice and environmental justice very much, uh, which was not, which is not, and was not the case of big mobilization, which were, were mostly about nature, nature preservation. So is that something important to see that that at these local scales, working about repair. Uh, recycling, uh, social security of alimentation, we're working on both uh, agenda, environmental and social. And, uh, and I think uh, it's uh, you, Peter, who, who you, you sent me this article about our aesthetics. Uh, because on this critical realism agenda, there was a paper about aesthetic and, uh, and the critical realism, you know. And, well, this guy refers to aesthetic as being uh, related to the feeling of betweenness, of being in relation. And I think what is very important for this ordinary environmentalism is about this betweenness, you know, feeling attached, not only, you know, to a bee or something, but just feeling attached to something, being related to whatever is around you. Uh, at least that's what we find uh, when we investigate. So, last thing about this story is it is about a multi-scholar engagement. Uh, I mean, most scholars until now have not been considering the multi-scholar engagement. I mean, it was because perhaps there were not enough geographers working on that. Uh, so we need to consider how these guys and girls are working on networks. Uh, and how they articulate spa spatial scales of engagement uh, and how one scale of engagement can be a resource for another one. For example, I, wo I was working on this eco-mapping. It's a group who have devoted its time to making this eco-map and distributing it to neighbors and also tourists and everyone. And so the resource is each initiative at a low school scale, but the resource is also the map as being the total combination uh, of this, all these activities. And they're using one scale with the other, you know, they're reinforcing one scale with the other and vice versa. So that's quite interesting. Uh, 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 I think there is also an, another film you could, uh, I think it's free on the la online, it's Wasteland. Uh, if you look at this movie online, Wasteland, by the artist uh, Vic Muniz, he has worked on uh, Wasteland uh, with garbage workers 
He has made, he is a very well-known artist and he has made a portrait of these guys and sold it to Christie's, you know, and brought back the resource to the, the wasteland workers. So this is how we use scales, spatial scales and scales of value. How do we use and make, uh, transform these scales of value as scales of opportunity? Uh, in political terms. So uh, this is it. So it's this way of analyzing things is far from constituting actors without action, uh, as the theory of collective behavior suggests, you know, or action without actors. Uh, it's because these people do develop forms of flexivity on territories, you know. They do think of what they're doing, how they're do going to do it, and how they can work in a, a network. So the territory, the environment, is being, um, uh, how would you say, a mediator of action, you know. You think yourself and the others through territories. Uh, your identity is constituted through territories and the way to relate to, uh, you relate to it with others, you know. It's very much about all kinds of mobilization in the environmental field you can see today. For example, if you take Notre Dame des Landes, which was quite a big mobilization, they thought themselves through territories. These guys, they did have a very, very different agenda. I mean, some were anarchists, some were workers somewhere, whatever. But they all related together to the defense of this territory in the name of a certain way of seeing agriculture. So, you know, this is the territory which plays this role. So I see that I have just half an hour. Well, I'm not going to talk uh, uh, because, as usual, because this is my way of working, I have prepared a 200 uh, slide show, 200 slides uh, show, so it's, uh, I can't make it in half an hour. Uh, I'm going to show you my work, but just to say uh, that you have to take into account how uh, the France, the United States, Germany, Netherlands, Russia, all these countries has, have a different culture, political culture, and how they do permit, allow this mobilization to gain momentum or not. And how they do allow this mobilization to work with municipalities and political uh, actors or not. Uh, for example, France is very much centralized, so it was quite difficult uh, to work with uh, political actors. If you think of Russia, it's even worse. So, I mean, even though big players in Russia, I have worked uh, like a long time in Russia, I have worked about commons in Russia too. Uh, and uh, Russia has permitted more in terms of commons than you think, but they don't want big players such as Greenpeace. They want grassroots mobilization. US history is very different. This book is a very good book, Civic Innovation in America. Uh, it tells you a lot about how these different groups at local scales, for example, taking care of, uh, of uh, water basing or taking care of different issues, have been deploying over the years. It, was a, it, it, it is a very different, uh, interesting group about, uh, book about engagement. So I can't talk German history as a strong, strong history of activation and direct democracy, as you can s I don't know if you looked at it online last week. It was uh, the referendum in Berlin, uh, a local referendum about the refusal, the rejection of, uh, of big, uh, of, uh, of uh, the way people were selling the cities. Uh, so you can see it online. It doesn't, uh, about landlords, major landlords. So this is another type of doing things with local, uh, with, uh, so this, are images. I'm just going to show you the work I've been doing to finish, you know, of different ways of relating through convention, 
charter with uh, municipalities. There are very much different ways of working with that. This is, you know, different practices in the street. You have to be very observant, look at the street, see what's going on in the streets, uh, in spaces, just not being in your head, but uh, being very wi within your eyes, the ears, and, and things like that. So different, you know, there are many of them. You can see them at, at all scales, very small things, even people taking care of, you know, and growing food uh, near railways, potatoes, so, and, you know, in, in, in spaces like that where nobody do want to go because they're just uh, rejected spaces, mostly, uh, a lot of them are, at least. Um, so, okay, and this was a work uh, that was done about stewardship in the States. I have been working with people, this major, a uh, network of, steward, of stewards at, uh, in cities, in different cities. Uh, and we have been working in, in uh, New York. You can see the stewardship, this very grassroots organization at, uh, in New York City, Staten Island, Manhattan, Brooklyn. And uh, we have been doing field work there. You know, seeing how this organization were transforming the city, how they do, how much money do they have, how they do organize themselves to do so. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, work my colleagues have been doing. So it has been going on since a long time. Uh, and uh, what is interesting with this group, it's uh, we're trying to measure the stewardship intensity, we're doing it uh, in Paris too, also, how many organizations in different spaces. For example, if you take the 18 uh, arrondissements de Paris, uh, in the northern part, there are more than 2,000 or uh, civic organizations like that. Uh, so it's a very intense space in terms of mobilization. But if you take other spaces, uh, like uh, richer spaces, there are less organization, or more centralized spaces, there are less organization. So it is very co-dependent of different factors, you know. Um, and also, what is interesting uh, is what I have been telling you, networks, hybridity, and how these groups do work together. Uh, so we have been doing it in Paris too, uh, trying to see which group do work with which group at what scale. Uh, so, and what we find the same than in the state is the meso level brokerage is increasing. Uh, that is very important. People are getting more organized, you could say otherwise. I mean, they're getting, uh, uh, more professional, especially in the state, but also in France. Uh, it's true too. Especially because the new generation, uh, newer generation of activists uh, do take, uh, uh, are, 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 are gaining mo momentum. And so they're more familiar with, uh, with uh, numeric, uh, with computers, with all this internet working, and they know how to use it. The first map at the European scale of all this organization was created like three or four years ago, not more. So it's quite new. It's called Transiscope. If you look online, you can find it. There are plenty, plenty of organization. It's a free movement. You register yourself online as an organization. You just describe what is your activity and with whom you would like to work. So it's a free movement of co-organization. So it's uh, in the state, it is very much uh, because uh, the, the place of the state is not the same as in France. Uh, the different actors, public sector has been working with this organization. 
And there is this kind of map they have been creating too. Uh, you see the New York City tree map. Do you know this city tree map? They have been, you know, involving plenty of stewards grassroots organization to plant trees in New York City. Each tree is taken care of by a, a group, for example. So on the on the on the on this map you can register your care, record tree care, you know. So you put yourself as uh, an organization and because we in the state uh, you register the ecological benefits of your care and how much money is a, 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 it is of value. I mean, it's like, you, you, it would never happen in France, never. <laughs> That's a funny thing. So I'm going to show you to finish what we have been doing in France, uh, the last maps, because some of you are yawning. So we have been working in something a bit different in collectives in Ile-de-France. It's a, it's a program I am directing. So first of all, what we're trying to, uh, to create is a map, a spatial map of how social and environmental in inequalities are mixing, can be, can be seen together. So this was the first work in 2014 we have uh, done. So there are what we call uh, environmental amenities, mostly green spaces. There are uh, e exposition to pollution, and on the upper side, there are social economical status. So we have mixed all these three, trying to see the spaces where you can find the most inequalities and the richer spaces, both in terms of nature and in, in terms of economic uh, status. So as you can see, Paris is just, uh, I, I, I'm not uh, tall enough, nobody is, but you see the, the red spot all on the bottom, on the uh, upper level. This is the 93, uh, what we call the Département uh, 93. The poorest neighborhoods, the more exposed to pollution, the less dotted with green spaces. Just under it, there is Paris. And this is the western part of the, of the great region of Ile-de-France, the richest, uh, with the bigger forest and, and such. So red is poor and less dotted in terms of environmental amenities and blue is the richest part. And if, if you look at this different map, uh, and this is about vote uh, and abstention, far right, and uh, on the other side, right and, uh, and uh, center. We won't discuss the vote, but there is a correlation, uh, a, a statistical correlation between vote and environmental and uh, social environmental inequalities. Uh, this is statistic, yeah? Can these results be found online? Yeah, absolutely. We published them, uh, not all of them, but uh, we published, but it's in French. Uh, so uh, you can find that. I, I will give you the... the, the and so what did we do after that? So this was, uh, for me, the idea of this work was to say that you can't tackle with socio-environmental justice if you don't tackle with, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Schlossberg, David Schlossberg. Okay, you can, it's, he works on environmental justice. He says that uh, he renewed, not, uh, not him alone mostly, but uh, he, he did say important things, uh, to my opinion, about environmental justice. He say so social environmental justice is not just about distribution or redistribution. It's also about process how you, uh, you, you taken into account into the decision, 
how uh, you able to, 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 to get more powerful uh, being involved in this decision. Uh, it's also about empowerment. So he has a four leg way of seeing justice uh, as being distributional, processual. I, I can show you the, the, the little, uh, the little uh, schema about it. Uh, capabilities, the third leg and the fourth leg is about procedural. Um, well, I'll show you afterwards because I'm going to... And so I thought right now in France, what we know is how the distribution, the spatial distribution of social, socio-environmental inequalities is. We are able to do this kind of map. But what do we know about how do people uh, tackle with this injustice at different scales. What do we know about mobilization related to this justice and uh, these inequalities? So that's how I went interrogating and investigating a lot of, uh, very much, a lot, lot, lot of uh, grassroots mobilization and trying to see right now um, I have been working on that since 10 years now, how they tackle with social environmental inequalities. How do they take it into account, you know? How, how different kind of people are taken into account into this uh, movement, organization. So we have done this map, uh, which was the same, but it's not a good map. It's, uh, it's not a good map. Uh, it doesn't work. And we have been working at different scale. I'm going towards the end just to, you know, at different scales. This is all the organization. We have been uh, in this ter territory of Plain Commune, uh, asking them what they were doing, how they were doing it, um, finding it very diverse and trying to see how they were tackling with inequalities. I'm going to show you the last thing. Uh, this, is, this is about the networks of this organization. As you can see, uh, they are very much related. The red one are in the same neighborhood, uh, yellow one in another neighborhood. So it means, uh, did I translate it? No. I didn't translate it. It means that most of the environmental organizations are still very localized. They do work in networks, but not at very big spa spatial scale. Uh, that has changed very, very quickly. This, yeah, these are the four municipalities in which I am working. Alors, why do I work? You can see it, Ivry. Uh, which was communist uh, since the uh, war. Uh, Clamart, which is uh, a very, uh, very, uh, quite a rich neighborhood. The 18 of northern part of Paris. And Aubervilliers, which is one of the poorest cities in France. Uh, and why, how did we do that? Remember my map with all kinds of inequalities. So we have done this statistical work, trying to discrete five classes. And this is, you remember the, the regional map I showed you? This is a newer version of this regional map. And we have been uh, trying to link social and environmental inequalities much more uh, finely attuned. I mean, we have been uh, deepening this work in order to, to be better. Uh, so we have created five classes of municipalities at the scale of, great, uh, of the Great Paris. Uh, they are, uh, you can't see very well the colors on this map, but they are very poor areas. Uh, these are the class four, for example, the, this purple. There are two purples. You see, and there are the reds. The red, the five class, where is Aubervilliers, is the poorest class. Then there is the, the lighter purple. Then there is the, 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 
the purple, which is a bit stronger, and the richest area are uh, the blue one. I mean, it's not the same on my uh, computer, so it's difficult to see. And this is, we have, uh, we have chosen four of these municipalities representative of one class, and we're doing our investigation, qualitative investigation, in each of this class, in each of this municipality which is representative of this class. So it is a, a way to link quantitative work and qualitative work in order to be more precise about how inequalities are being worked on as a process, not as a state in the great Paris right now. So this is it. Uh, we can discuss, uh, this is just a verbatim uh, of one of the organizations, how they do relate to the environment and what do they work on. And I am, I am finished. I just want to listen to questions. I, I could, I could, uh, I could uh, speak for us, but uh, I think I have spoken enough, and uh, that's enough for today. So, do you have questions or whatever commentaries? Yes. Given for granted the importance of these local communities, then two questions. The first one, should this state, or say when I say the state, you can say the central government or local government, should have an active position on, this, on these uh, initiatives? That's the first question. And if the answer is yes, what kind exactly of public policies should it implement to, to bolster these things and do and not to yes and without uh, going into the risk of institutionalizing them right so how should it well this is a difficult question because we have a culture of considering that mobilization should, should stay apart from the state or local public powers. Right now, this mobilization, uh, there is also another way of seeing it. It's a neoliberalism extension, making them work uh, instead of the state, for example. I mean, they do uh, create uh, big spaces. They do manage these big spaces. They do manage inequalities, uh, for example, for alimentation. Uh, and so some people do think that, uh, that uh, valorizing this work is making the game of neoliberalism. You know, some people have been telling me that I work on organizations that are symptomatic of a ne neoliberal state. You have another way of seeing it also. I mean, nothing is, you know, black or white, oh, at least in this field, you know. These people, I was yesterday in this uh, communist, uh, one of the last communist uh, municipalities, and there are many, many organizations, uh, like 1,000 organizations. So the municipality, because it was uh, recently re-elected, but with a list of citizens on its, uh, on its uh, majority. So many, many citizens are now involved in the making of politics at this local scale. Uh, in these municipalities, there are like 100,000 people. So it's not a very big city, but it's not small though. And uh, these uh, local uh, organizations, they're very, very happy to work with the municipality. I mean, even, I mean, I was with this, um, organization that was created by gypsies because in this municipality there is a strong camp of just of gypsies gypsies yes gypsies yeah and uh, rome or gypsies uh, and these guys they were doing they were recycling uh, a lot 
and now they recognize as the main recycler on the municipality by the municipality. And they told me that they wanted to become uh, a public service. I mean, I never thought I would hear that in the mouth of people coming from, uh, I mean, being so far away from public power. You know, that was very interesting to hear that in this case, these people, they wanted to be integrated by the local power. Uh, it's not always the case, but this was the case. So I guess it depends. It's not yes or no. It depends on the states. It depends on the local power. It depends how the, 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 the power game is displaying. I mean, uh, I am very Ostromian in my way of considering how this polycentric, very differentiated organization are linked to local powers and working multiple scales together. At least in this municipality, they have a strong program of work in terms of climate change uh, uh, struggle. I mean, they do something that's very, uh, I mean, I find in that very relieving to be with them and to work with them, in fact. So I, I guess I didn't answer your question. I don't have a yes or no. I just have a depends. <laughs> That's not a good issue. Yes? Um, thank you very much for your presentation. It was super interesting. Also, if you can share it maybe with David or in the email, that would be very nice because I didn't yeah. copy some names. <laughs> um, I just wanted to emphasize a little bit about the theory of care and the theory of environmental care and which are the connections between feminist movements and ecological ones. Because to me, there are a lot of similarities and also uh, maybe they share to me like a similar uh, the drawback, which is they are not uh, global somehow, they are always like making more locally and it's difficult <coughs> to, to, to make a global policy on this. Um, but uh, my question would be, I think both movements have very similar ways of doing democracy bottom up in the sense that they are built like in the structures and they then can go to the superstructure. And to me, a very good example of feminist movements are South American ones, for example, the, the abortion becoming legal in in Argentina, I'm from there. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you have a good example, like these bottom-up policies made in the ecological sphere, in a global or local... Uh the climate justice movement have worked very much uh, from bottom-up uh, to global to back bottom-up. Uh, if you follow its history, it's very interesting it, uh, seeing how they, this guy have networked from mm. grassroots back and forth. Uh, uh, climate justice movement. Uh, so I, I, I can give you, I mean, names of organization you can look at, but uh, it's, they're very much linked to grassroots organization too. So it's a polycentric, very, very moving movement. Uh, and they have linked uh, climate issues with social issues very much and all kind of social issues, you know. Uh, so I think it's, it's funny because when you work with this movement, I mean, if you look at the media, you just have uh, this drastic news about how the world is going to doom. Uh, and if you work with these guys, multiple, multiple organization, you see the world moving somehow differently. I mean, it's like a different landscape. Uh, and you always wonder if it's true, or uh, you're just dreaming. Uh, are the media, media truer? I mean, do they, uh, is the tale of doom truer than the tale of people moving and changing and doing things at the, on the, at the surface of this planet. Uh, there is also something which is interesting, I guess I, I didn't have time to show you, it's not even on this, uh, on this one. Uh, 
is this successful? No, I don't think I have. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, they have been re-socializing public space. Somehow, you know, they have been transforming this public space that was very much thought as the outside of the domestic space, of the individualized space, and they have been transforming it in order for us to see it as a possible space of action. Now, when you look, for example, the students, my French students, not you, but the students I've been teaching to, we're working with the city of Paris to transform the whole campus here in the biodiversity and that them who are working. They've been doing the plan, the mapping out, and the city of Paris have be, has been allowing it, uh, but it's them who have... Uh, and I think if these things didn't exist beforehand, they wouldn't have thought of it. I mean, it's also something of incremental transformation. It's, uh, it's petit à petit. It's a rather slow process uh, regarding climate change, but it's still a process. Are there other questions or issues? Yes? There is only one mic, so... Yeah, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question would be m maybe more about your own experience working on it, because on my experience uh, with a button-up movement, it's really hard to engage people and communities, and usually uh, there's lots of different problems, especially when the, the community or the neighborhood that people trying to, to get involved uh, are already uh, co-opted by the capitalist logic. Then my question is, uh, first, uh, where is the capillarity of this movement? How many people those movements uh, really engage with this kind of movement. If uh, there are the same people, or if there is like a, a kind of a transition, and it's not only some people, activists pushing it up, but there is like something really like a community, then uh, there is like a, always new people coming in, and so on and so far, or if it's always the same people that are pushing it. Then, yeah, the capillarity, how much democratic, how many people it engage, if it's the same people or not, and also uh, the cities that you studied, they are like uh, all kind of small cities and then do not really have a less aggressive capitalist logic within it or it's only works on big cities and yeah, I would like to know more about the peculiar peculiarities of it. Uh, about cities, I've been working in big cities, obviously, like Paris, New York, Moscow, uh, and in small cities, like, uh, I, don't, I don't have the, the figures here, but I was working in Netherlands, in Arnhem, or, or in Berlin, too, in prison Strassen. Uh, so there are different movements, different <coughs> ways of working. I mean, it's difficult to, to have a general judgment of, about this organization because they are so numerous. They are all styles. They are very, you know, very privatized organization, like uh, one person and somehow some person around, and this person has all power, just, you know, keep the power for, its, for himself or herself. And, also, there are very big networks. So, I mean, it's difficult to have to be uh, to generalize, you know, at this. Uh, what is interesting, I would say, is this is uh, the, the you, you use the word of uh, how do you say? Um, reticularity, reticularity. I mean, how more than never. Uh, I found this organization networking at different scale. I mean, this is very interesting. If you think about uh, the cost of internal, uh, internationalization uh, uh, before and now, 
to put two organizations, small organizations together, for example, about the free cats. I mean, they are, these are very poor people. I mean, I have been investigating in Roma, in, uh, in different cities, these free cats people, they are very, very poor people, uh, especially before. I, don't, I haven't done any investigation since 2010, but uh, before they were mostly women of popular classes, very devalorized too, you know, and they were among the first I saw online. Uh, that was very interesting, and they, 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 they just uh, have been networking on this free cut movement at the European scale. I mean, why, how, why did they feel the urge to network? And I don't know, I mean, it's like, uh, it's interesting, it, it depends on the organization. Uh, I would like to understand better, this is what my research is about, do uh, replay, replace the link in between geography and politics. I mean, that's what interests me uh, in terms of organization. How networking at different scales like I do uh, change the way the municipality can work with them. For example, I was with the elected this morning of this communist uh, city and there was its different organization and this elected person said is a member of the citizen amongst the elected. And he said, uh, well, you're going to work at the scale of the city. And the other guy said, no, we, we, we're going to be lodged by the city, but we're going to spread out throughout all the territory, through Paris and all around. And I saw that the guy from the municipality was a bit I mean, he didn't get it. I mean, uh, uh, because for him, the, the politics of the city were very open to this organization, but it was for the city. But he understood suddenly that he was working also for the other city around. So, and it, it was not in his mandate. So that was something confusing for him. I don't know if I, uh, you understand what I mean? But th that's interesting how it, it does replace the logic of geography. I mean, the usual scale of the political power. 